Good evening and welcome to Law Talk, the show that brings the law, the Constitution, and the issues of today into an understanding from a legal perspective. Mark, how are you doing tonight? Excellent, excellent. And so what are we covering tonight? Well, we're going to start off with the fiscal cliff averted. Uh, was the fiscal cliff averted? Well, technically, yes. And what is the fiscal cliff? The fiscal cliff was a political uh, impasse or confrontation that was kind of a, they've been kicking the can down the road for a long time to try to decide how to handle the economy. It's kind of tough because they haven't had a budget for four years or forever, uh, for a long time. There's Not been no, budget. no budget under this administration. No, there's been no budget for four years, but they're trying to figure out what to do with the economy, but they don't have any numbers to work with. Well, I understand because we have the $16 trillion in debt that uh, finding a solution to the spending problem mm -hmm. and the taxing problem was at the heart of the fiscal cliff. Well, the fiscal cliff was they were going to make some automatic cuts to, you know, kind of uh, uh, conservative causes and liberal causes, very, very, very sharp cuts. They were going to take from the military, which would be bad for the conservatives. They were going to take from, um, you know, uh, social All the spending, social programs. So social spending right. uh, kind of thing, right. uh, kind of get out the vote method things that they used. Right. Well, that was the sequester. That right. was the agreement that was established between uh, the bipartisan committee. Right. And what they came up with is a sequester which said, if you can't reach a budget by the end of 2012, on January 1st of 2013, we're going to automatically implement these dramatic draconian cuts. Half you know, what was it, uh, $500 billion from the from defense and $500 billion from the social programs. Now, did they do that on January 1st? Well, I think what the deal came down to was they're going to raise taxes um, on, you know, on it, kind of a smattering of things. They're raising taxes on 77 million Americans through their Social Security uh, taxes are going up, or their, their uh, uh, FICA taxes are going up. FICA, yes. FICA is going up from 4.2 to 6.2. So that's kind of a thousand dollars to a guy who makes fifty thousand dollars a year uh, more taxes. They're going to raise taxes for folks making over uh, four hundred fifty thousand dollars quite a bit. Um, Aren't you know, they going up to thirty nine point six percent? Isn't yeah. that the next number? And that seventy seven number isn't that seventy seven percent? Not seventy. Not it's a huge number. It's it's over three quarters of the country right. is having a direct taxing relationship as a result. Uh, the fiscal cliff band-aid they put on well, by January 1st. One of the biggest things is the uh, capital gains is going up from 15 to 20 percent. That's a lot. Now, capital gains is kind of a, a way that you would, you know, would convince investors. You take your money out of savings, take it out of gold, take it out of, or take it back from overseas or whatever you're doing, put it into America and invest it into American businesses, right? And you'll be taxed 15 percent. Now, a lot of people say, well, why is you know, capital gains so low? How come it's not 39, 50%? How come it's not 95%? How come it's not 100%? You know, because it's capital gains. Well, wait well, a minute, but usually, wait a But the Let thing me... is, usually when people have capital gains, they earned it once. They already paid their right. 45, 50, 75% or whatever you add up all your taxes. And then they're investing in that. And then they're going to pay double taxation. on That was the reason you had about 15%. But I think more than that, I think the biggest thing is the capital gains increase. Because that's basically the government saying to people, don't invest in business. Hold on to your money. We're going to invest in government because we depend on government. And don't really invest in business. Keep your money. If you're a big corporation, keep your money overseas. If you're here in the United States, keep your money in gold. Don't invest in business. Don't take any risk. We're going to put the money in the government. The government's going to take care of you. There's no more risk. The government's going to take care okay, of you. Okay, well, this seems to be a pattern in this administration going back to the first four years. And now, the grand scheme that I've seen in this administration is to have a cradle-to-grave type of environment. But investment is what drives the economy in a capitalist society. Well, not anymore. With, well, Forget that's what that. it's supposed Forget to be. That's that. what capitalism is. Yeah, but there's, there's money this is, this sitting is. offshore. We, we all know there's about a trillion dollars sitting offshore <laughs> from companies like Google, Oracle, just sitting there, and they're not bringing it back because they see no way to invest it properly, and the government refuses to give them a break to bring it back, which would stimulate the economy. But how did the fiscal cliff stimulate the economy? Well, the... Uh, or did it? <clears throat> I don't know if it, it did any stimulation of the economy. What it did, it said, okay, we're going to kind of double down on the theory that we're going to raise taxes and then have more uh, government spending. And we're going to grow the government, spend more spend more money on government programs, and we're going to raise taxes. So that's kind of what the, what the result was. But wait a minute. Did, let's use an example. France passed a law 
that 75 percent of all your income, if you're above a certain dollar figure, unless you move to Russia, unless you move to Russia, <laughs> like to Gerard Dib de Bordeaux, and he yeah, got a, a Russian passport. But right. you saw that the French courts rejected that. The French Supreme Court said, "No, we are not going to do that. This is unconstitutional. You can't." tax people 75 percent of their income but if you really start but i've adding, heard those numbers here but if you start adding up you know your property tax your sales tax like say you know you're at 10 percent in san francisco you've got you know you've got your property tax you've got uh income tax you we're getting in that 60 70 percent area here well too. you realize that yeah. they're not taxes they're fees yeah, well, fees or taxes, whatever you want to call them. You know, if it walks like a duck and talks like a duck, <laughs> it must be a duck. It's pretty, it's pretty much a duck. But yeah, we're in that area. We're in the 60, 70 percent. Okay, range. so now let's go back to the sequester, which is actually one of the scariest events out of this. We had, in fact, the fiscal cliff. Let me redefine this properly. The fiscal cliff is actually the sundown of the Bush tax cuts, which included an estate tax raising being raised from 35 to 55 percent. And the the maximum number be, being reduced from five million to one million on the exemption side. So right there, did they include any of the estate tax changes? I'm I'm, I'm not exactly positive, but I think the exemption stayed at the five same. million. I think it stayed the same or close to the same. Yeah. Now, did they still use the the uh, the the idea that uh, high income is two hundred fifty thousand, or did they? I understand that they wanted to bump that I up think, to four hundred. I think 000. I think four hundred fifty thousand is what they consider. Uh, uh, rich now, you know. It started out being millionaires, and then the millionaires became two hundred thousand years, and then they kind of bounced around. And the millionaires became four hundred fifty thousand years. So well, you know, yeah. that's not that much money. But the thing about it is, what it really comes down to is, it's it's a matter of concept. Because you talk about a tax cut, I don't really believe you can have a tax cut. I mean, people earn honestly earn income, and then depending on the power of the government, they confiscate some of that income, and they call that a tax. Um, but see, now it's not that you have honestly earned income and the government's confiscating some of that money. Now all the government's the money. And, you know, they have everything. Everything you earn is the government's, and then they let you have some back. It's really what, we've, what we're coming up to against now. Well, you know, the government's uh, but once again, are we basically changing every, the basic format of what this country's built on, which is capitalism, independence, driving for yourself, well, that the ability to the, earn a living is that my right. Didn't that didn't work out. That didn't work so out. So are we not, changing all we're that We're not doing now. that anymore. No, no, we're, we're not we're, doing We're giving that all up. We're giving that up. The government, and what are we, what are we well, letting come to? Well, the government has an elite of very intelligent, well-trained, uh, very efficient people. They're in charge of everything now, and they just kind of tell everyone what to do for their own good. For their own good. Because if you were going to make your own individual decisions, you would be making these silly, stupid decisions. When the government's in charge and telling you what to do, everything works a lot better. Well, is that what we is that the new reality then? That's that's under this new program. That's the way things are going here. That the, the money the money is controlled by the government now, and a tax cut. Well, wait a minute, it's not a tax cut. It's your money. You know how can uh, how can someone <laughs> cut something that's yours? Right? That's yours to begin yeah, with. Yeah, you've so, earned it. But just using that the fact that people say tax cut means that the government belongs everything belongs to the government. And then they, they cut some of what they're taking from you and giving you back. So yeah, but wait a minute. They, they, everybody this is can... sounding more and more like Greece and <laughs> Spain and Portugal and Italy. Where are we going with this? Are we supposed to expect that the, from the moment we're born, like little Jimmy at, at one month old is already starting to get a check from the government? Well, no, but I mean, there's a different classes. There's if you work for the government, then you're kind of like... You're like the you're prison. You're immune. Well, you're like a prison guard, and if you were out there in the private enterprise working, you're like the prisoner. You're like the slave, and you oh. support the government. So you've got an elite in government, and then you've got your worker bees who are in the private yeah, enterprise. I, I, I understand yeah. that, but this sounds like that TV show that used to be on a long time called The Prisoner, where you yeah. don't know who's really running anything, yeah, yeah. and you're running up and down the beach hoping <laughs> you find something, and the only thing chasing you is that big ball down the beach. <laughs> yeah. But is that what the fiscal cliff is chasing? Well, the fiscal cliff, what happens, they raise taxes. Mm -hmm. um, they didn't really do any cuts at all in government spending. Government grew, taxes went up. Well, yeah, listen, I think we're going to have to leave it there because this fiscal cliff, I know we're going to come back to because they're coming back to Well, it. in two months, it's going to yeah. resurface so on what, the debt what's limit. What's our next subject tonight, Mark? Well, the next subject is, is a big tragedy, a huge tragedy. And we're uh, are we talking about Sandy Hook? We're talking about it in, in Newton. Yeah, yeah we're, Newton. It, a huge tragedy where someone came into a school, shot a bunch of people. Yeah, um, actually, what I want to tell the viewers on this, this is extremely critical, because what happened in Aurora, Denver, outside of Denver, and in Newton, Connecticut, are events that 
uh, both Mark and I will tell you firsthand that are tr very much tragedies. You can't have children shot. You can't have this type of violence. But the reaction to this is not where the reaction, the blame should be placed. Because uh, Lanza, the shooter at Newton, actually was had severe mental problems and his mother still allowed him access to weapons. So we don't look at the weapon necessarily, but we have to look at a broader picture of things like mental health. Why did he have access? And then why did he have access to guns like a Bushmaster? I mean, so this is huge. There's a huge world here. But just like Rahm Emanuel has said, you never let a good disaster go by without capitalizing on it. So what's the Democratic Party want to do now? Well, there's a little backstory to this that was kind of interesting. Uh, there was a newspaper in New Jersey who uh, published the addresses on their website of everyone who owned guns in their area and kind of, uh, you know, I guess tried to shame him into giving their guns back. Right. But what was interesting... Well, wait a minute. You're talking about legal gun owners. Legal gun owners. You're right. talking about registered legal yeah, right. gun owners were publicized... Right. In, in effectively internationally right. by this newspaper. Yeah, and they were put on a website so you could have, you know, oh. there's a little pin there. You could see where their house was. And, you know, you can Google anything so you could see what their yard was and what their kids are like and everything. So you basically said, okay, let's target all these gun owners and uh, try to shame them into... Giving up their guns. Giving up their guns. Or maybe if there's people who need a gun who are criminals, that's the they place can go, they, that's where they go yeah, get them. Yeah, but doesn't that open the door for all the people that didn't have a gun, well, that wait, wait, burglars wait, might go there and but, try to but what, burglar a home? But the whole theory there, because these people were anti-gun, the whole theory backfired on them. Because what happens, and all the people who didn't have guns, who, you know, who, who were the neighbors, said, well, geez, they're going to come to my house and burgle my house. So they all went out and bought guns. So basically what happens, more people went out and bought guns. And as a matter of fact, the newspaper itself, because people were upset about them, you know, going and publicizing their, 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 where their wives and kids and families were and, mm -hmm. you know, making them a target. You know, they made some complaints. So they, uh, the newspaper had to ar hire armed guards. So basically all, over, all the way around, everyone kind of is against guns. But when they get trouble... They want to hire a gun. They always want to have a gun. So, okay, well... Yeah, but there's, there's one thing about this controversy is that nobody is really very moderate about this. I mean, people are very for guns or they're anti-guns. There's not really a lot of middle ground. Yeah, well, wait a minute. Let's talk about the Second Amendment. That is what the basis uh, that, uh, that the argument for the National Rifle Association and the Democrats have uniquely argued the Second Amendment. Uh, first of all, the Second Amendment is, is a constitutional right to bear arms. Now... It's not a constitutional right that is, is limited to if you're part of the National Guard or a part of a militia. No. The Second Amendment says each individual in the United States has a right to bear arms. And it's not to bear arms against people invading the country. It is made to fight the tyranny of government. And that all the dicta that's been written by all the, uh, the people that went into creating the Constitution says the very right of the individual to bear a weapon is a right of a citizen of the United States. So what are they trying to do to people that own guns now, Mark? Well, I think they want to take them away. What do you mean but, take them away? But I mean, I think out what, out? What, what, what Thomas Jefferson said about this, he said it was kind of a couple of interesting quotes. He said, those who hammer their guns into plowshares will plow for those who do not. That, that do not hammer their guns in a And plow then shirt. he also said that the strongest reason for people to retain the right to keep and bear arms is a last resort to protect against tyranny in the government. So there's a couple ways of, you know, if you go to the Jefferson Memorial and you look what's in there in, the, in, the, in his, you know, memorial and what's written there, he's saying, well, you don't want to confuse this, you know. The right to bear arms has not necessarily, I mean, it's true that you want to be able to defend yourself. It's true that you want to go hunting. But the, what the Second Amendment is about is, is that if people have guns, right, it's less likely the government will be a tyrannical government. That's correct. I mean, that is what the Second Amendment is about. Now, when you talk about militias and you go, well, you know, you're not in a militia, so you shouldn't have a gun. But that's not that's what... That's only the first part of that sentence. But that's not what the forefathers said. If you, if you look back on some of the, you know, George Mason, when they're back in the Constitutional Congress and they're arguing about it, they say, I asked her, what is the militia? It is, the, it, is the, it is the whole people, except for a few public officials. So what they're saying, the militia is anybody, is everybody. anybody who's not a government official is, is the militia. militia. Is the militia. So, um, and if you even go back further in time, you go back to Machiavelli. I'm sure you read Machiavelli de Prince. He said, 
You're bound to meet misfortune if you aren't armed because, among other reasons, people despise you. Um, and so, you know, in Sam Adams said, the Constitution shall never be construed to prevent the people in the United States who are peaceful citizens from keeping their own arms. So, of course, it's a tragedy when you have some kind of shooting like this. And, you know, they, these things do occur. Now, there's counter arguments if you're just going to talk about, um, talk about whether it's good for people to have guns as far as public safety. Now, there's arguments for people saying that, wait a minute, um, you know, there was 2 million crimes uh, defeated, 2 to 2.5 million crimes defeated last year or per year. Because of the, oh, gun, cause, the cause people had guns. a weapon. Okay, and, uh, and also they're talking about banning assault weapons. Well, criminals in general use a 38 or a 9 millimeter pistol. They don't really use assault weapons. I guess they're kind of hard to hide under their coat. Well, or you can't really walk down the street right. carrying an AK-47. <clears throat> so, I mean, there's a lot of different um, arguments about gun and gun ownership. But when you're talking about the Second Amendment, it really comes down to a, it's a political issue where you're saying if, if the citizens can bear arms, it's less likely the government will try to be well, let's, let's talk about who. This is what I mentioned a moment ago. What the what the, the the Democratic Party has tried to do right now. Let's not forget who's president. President Obama has stated that no one should really own even own a handgun. Uh, Attorney General Holder has stated that nobody should be owning a handgun. Nancy Pelosi says the Second Amendment says you have to be part of a militia <laughs> to own a handgun. And Dianne Feinstein entered a bill into into the Senate starting with banning all, all highest uh, assault weapons, high-capacity magazines. Um, so there's been all this. And then Governor Cuomo ha and from New York has decided that he wants to confiscate all handguns and all weapons because his state should be safe. What, what he's saying is the safe should be safe if you're somebody with a gun, but the rest of you, oh, we'll protect you. Well, I mean, the moderate position, and I think it was a, it was by a movie star. I'm not sure who it was, but he got pulled over on the freeway, and he right. had an illegal weapon pistol right. under the seat, and it was very famous. So the the press was saying, well, you know, do you think everyone have a gun? Should have a gun, you know? Yeah. And he said, no, just just me. So I mean, uh, you know, the moderate position is like, not everyone should have a gun. I should just have one. So yeah. of course, everyone wants to have a gun, and they want no one else to have one. Okay, uh, well, I think what that, we ought to do... And if is, you're in the government, the yeah. government had guns. They don't they want people... They all have guns. But they, I think what we ought to do is wait, because this is the ongoing issue. And I think we should move on to our third subject. And what is that tonight, Mark? Well, we're talking about Solomon. And and National, who's that? National Labor Relations Board. NLRB! And uh, there's been a lot of things going on with the National Labor Relations Board. And there's been some... Um, there's a Are huge, you talking about normal things going on? Or some hanky-panky going there's on? There's a huge fight now... Um, over these recess appointments. There are three, um, three people appointed, and uh, the, the president appointed three people to the board um, when he claims the Senate was in recess. The Senate says, no, we weren't in recess. They were we were never in recess. We had somebody there had with a gavel. Gaveling. We, we, we were going through. So there were, Isn't that when the president tried to appoint those people during the Christmas holiday? And now it turns out that those appointments shouldn't have been made because the Senate was never in recess. And if the Senate is not in recess, you can't appoint anyone to any government position of this level, especially the NLRB, unless they're approved by Congress. Isn't well, that correct? Well, it was in January 2011. Maybe it was around New Year's. But anyway. Yeah, it was New Year's. But anyway, so that's the, that's the now there's oral arguments for her December 18th. Um, we're going to see what happens. It's in court now, and we'll see um, what, these, what happens with these recess appointments. Um, but what's interesting about it is now you have a completely uh, – Liberal Na National Labor Relations Board right. uh, board there, and uh, you know very pro union. So when you say pro union, what so what happened? What's the effect of that? So what but what's actually happened is it's because there's been this pro union uh, takeover at, at kind of the higher levels. Um, the states have been fighting back, and a lot of that states have been passing right to work uh, legislation. What does right to work mean, Mark? Right to work is okay. Let's say that I'm want to be a plumber or something like that, right? Right. Well, I can't work as a plumber unless I'm in the plumbers union, okay? And I can't be in the plumbers union unless, unless I, I pay, dues. pay union dues, right? right. <clears throat> and, uh, and that's well and fine as far as I'm concerned in, in the private sector. Now, in the public sector, I think it's a little unfair because that union dues is actually, you know, taxpayer money. And then it goes to the union, which is usually pretty closely related to whoever's in, in, in politi power. politics. And they, the money kind of... Are you trying to tell me that politicians 
would encourage unions as for all the workers in government because those union dues actually go back to the politicians in the name of well, goes lobbyists in, well, goes and in their campaign, elections. Campaign, and not only that, they... Campaign the, contributions. Campaign contributions, demonstrations, having people show up, getting out the vote. I mean, like the SEIU with their purple <clears throat> shirts. But, I mean, it's, it's getting out the vote. Yeah. It's the getting out the vote machine. So, basically, what you have is a branch of the government paying using taxpayer money to get reelected. Large amount on a of, complete returning basis. Yeah, I mean, a huge amount of taxpayer money is used to to get out the vote for right. the. And there's a there's a kind of incestuous cycle here where, you know, people are well. There was just a situation where someone wanted to be on a city council board of the union member, and you know they're working on their own contracts and that kind of thing. So there's a little bit of conflict of interest in some of these issues, and so um, I would say. But even but the right to work states, he talks even about private enterprise, okay? Well, I understand that uh, there, uh, Michigan just had a vote, and it was overwhelmingly they voted for uh, the right to work right. and where they wanted to limit the union's ability to uh, demand uh, union dues. And part of right to work says, hey, I don't mind being part of a union, but you can't make me pay you every month. Or every paycheck. <clears throat> well, that's what they call free riders, because the union would say, "Look, well, I'm negotiating with you. We're using our union, and we're negotiating uh, for you on your behalf. We're using right, our union right, muscle. Right. Um, you know, you should support us." Um, now, Missouri, Kentucky, Montana, Alaska, and Pennsylvania—these are all where there's going to be future right-to-work state fights. And uh, so you kind of have this balance. Of the, the NRRB has been very. You know, they, they said, okay, Boeing, you can't move to, I guess it was South Carolina. From Washington Carolina. to South Carolina. South Carolina, Carolina which is right to work state. Um, so Boeing had to move back. I think the, the result of that was, I think that. Uh, no, they were able to build a plant in South Carolina, but they <laughs> still had to employ people in Washington. <laughs> well, I mean, but I think that what that happened, I think a lot of those contracts went to France to Airbus. Yeah. So what happened is like, you were, you were kind of fighting over this thing and saying, look, okay, you can't build this in South Carolina, but. Basically, it came to the advantage of France because, right. because they had the Airbus contract. So, right. um, but they did move it back to Washington, and a lot of people saw that as a little bit of a kind of a, a strong arm tactic. And so, I think that really kind of started pushing these right to work states, where people said, "Look, this is, you know, a little overplaying of the hand here." Well, and, and um, I, I do I do know that Boeing did make a a decision to keep employment in Washington. They actually well, hired... Well, they had to move back, yeah. But no, they didn't completely move back. They did move to South Carolina, but they didn't move the entire operation. The 737, right? Yeah. The Dreamliner they, they, or whatever. They still kept production in, in Washington to ensure... Washington, which is not a right-to-work state, right. so they split their, their employment between the two states, is right. what they actually did. But... And right. Washington is a right to smoke dope state. You can smoke yeah, marijuana. They're smoking, yeah, they're smoking the weed. There <laughs> yeah, now. you can smoke marijuana. But in it's there. interesting that Michigan would vote for right to work because Michigan's the heart of the AFL CIO and building the United Auto Workers and building cars. And, and that's a union stronghold. But to have the majority of the population in Michigan vote for the right to work, that should be telling the union something that this is a trend. And you know that uh, the trending on unions is actually going down. Uh, right. The the average uh, the average worker used to be up to thirty some odd percent was union. Now it's down to right around twenty percent is union, and they see nothing but the trend going down. So they need. Well, that's why they know that's why they have to move into government. That's what the, that's why they've right. been moving into government. And so now and they what control do they the do? government. SEIU, the government workers, right. all of these unions in the government. And so who's yeah. doing the most hiring under under this? Administration well, the is, government is, is, is the hiring bloating. the yeah. government yeah. employees. Yeah. They're, the government's they're bloating. extremely bloated. Right. And you know what's interesting is the average government uh, employee makes far more than the average private sector employee. Yeah, about, so yeah. now they're building a strength in the union in the government employees. Well, like they say, workers' rights are human rights. You know, all the worker rights and, are human and, rights. And people voted for the American way, which is you are your brothers and sisters keeper. Right. So that's that's the union. Uh, you know, way of, motto? way of looking at it. And, uh, you know, uh, the president was didn't really talk much about Wisconsin, right, before the election. No. He was pretty quiet about that, but I don't think he'll be uh, quiet out of the rest of these right-to-work well, states. Well, he did stack the NLRB with uh, with a pro-union bunch. Right. And I do know that Trumpka, the head of the AFL-CIO, uh, was one of the major visitors to the White House during the first administration. 
So I believe that uh, the union will increase their strength under the next four years of the president. Right. But the question is, will the people really want that to happen, or will there be these continuing right to work? As, as you know, Mark, uh, governor, Republican governors in the, in the United States has gone up dramatically. So if a Republican governor and a Republican Senate in any given state decides they want to go right to work, it's not going to be California, but what happens if the, 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 the shades of right to work states start overpowering the union the 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 union states. I, I like. What do you think is going to happen? Well, I, are we going to go? Are we going to have busting heads? What is going to? I think the trend will be for more government. Uh, you know, the the government. If you have if the union NRLB is pushing in the private enterprise, we'll see what happens on this case about the recess appointments. But if the union keeps pushing, that'll that'll decrease investment in the private sector. Not people aren't going to put money in the private sector. Less hiring, depress that sector. Those people, because they're going to be laid off or they can't find jobs, they're going to need food stamps. They're going to need social welfare. That'll increase the size of government. But, so but that, this I think is that's, putting more people on the dole. Well, that's and, a and, and the problem that's a is... Good, that's a good thing because you want to have basically... If everyone's on the dole, then the government's taking care of well, everyone. Well, isn't there a tipping point at 50%? If over 50% of people on the dole, won't that demand that the, 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 the next election, when people say what they're going to do for the people on the dole... Whoever gives the most amount of money to the people that don't want to work, aren't they going to have the opportunity to win again in a landslide? Because, oh, we want our free dollars. Now, I, I don't know, Mark. I've worked since I was at least seven years old, one form or another. I believe work is a good thing. But this country seems to be evolving to a point where I think it's a good thing if you go to the mailbox and get a check. Well, I think you've got a bad attitude. You know? I got a bad attitude. You got a bad attitude because I want to work. The, if, you know what they've taught in schools for the last 25, 30 years is that the government's here to take care of you from cradle to grave. And then, and how's it paid for? You pay for it by printing more money. You got to print more money, but you see, mean, I, I can no, you put me only, in a loan, Mark? The only problem with <laughs> the, only, the only problem with printing more money is that, you know, the, your commodities increase in price. So instead of bread being a dollar, it's now five dollars, and so it'll be six, eight, nine, ten, fifteen, twenty dollars. So as you print money, price of everything goes up. Um, you know, you shift into the government sector. It's kind of nice because people have security, but in the end, people will be much, much poorer. If you look at every system that relies on government redistribution, the society at large, the per you capita. You a key word, redistribution. Yeah, the, is that the, where this is going? The per, per capita income is always much lower than you would if you had a robust kind of private enterprise. Well, I got to tell you, Mark, I, it's, uh, it's a change. I believed I was raised in a capitalist society. I believe I, it, it's been turned into something else, but I still see hope. Well, the, but the I thing hope, is, which, which hope is, is there? And I don't mean hope and change. I no, mean, but, I but, think the, hope. but I think you're missing the point. See, it used to be if you wanted to do charity, if you wanted to do the right thing, you would rely on your conscience and people shaming mm -hmm. you doing the right thing. But now the government has guns and they're making sure you do the right thing under the threat of force. Okay, so well, that's a much that, better thing. That brings us our whole show together. <laughs> and I wanted to thank you again for joining us on Law Talk. And Mark, thank you for your evening, and I wish everybody a happy new year. This is our January show. Okay. And I would like to say this. Be aware, and we'll do it right. Thanks, okay. Mark. Happy New Year. Happy New Year to you.